from South Africa originally. I've only been in Australia for 12 years, so most of my life has been in South Africa. And sometimes I, when I get tired and I'm in Australia, I talk about South Africa instead of South Australia, and people get very angry. Um, but what I would like to say is that South Africa has had a very long relationship with the government of Flanders, and that immediately after the um, end of the apartheid um, regime in South Africa in 1994, the Flemish government was very supportive in um, helping us uh, with our de the development of our multilingual policy in South Africa. So I've actually had a long uh, relationship with um, VVOB, although it was a different generation of VVOB from the present uh, VVOB. But I just would like to say that there is a long relationship uh, between South Africa and uh, and Belgium, particularly Flanders. I'm going to be talking to you about multilingualisms and translanguaging and transknowledging. And the focus really is obviously um, concerns that we all have all over the world at the moment in relation to how we include children from migrant backgrounds, particularly within mainstream education systems. Because most of my work has been done in sub-Saharan Africa, but over the last 12 years I've also been working in Central Asia and South Asia and Southeast Asia, I've got a perspective on um, what is working and what isn't working in most parts of the world. And I'm assuming that everybody knows that um, some people would argue that there are over 7,000 languages of the world. About 51% of these are in the Asia-Pacific region. 96% of the world's languages are, originate outside of Europe and North America. So, the, so, did I say 86 or 96? I did say 96, right? 96, so only 4% of the world's languages originate in Europe. So one needs to understand that multilingualism has a very long history everywhere, but people working in the so-called global south, the post-colonial countries are very familiar with some of the complexities that now face um, countries in Europe particularly. What is happening is that on account of the um, movement of, can I just, is that okay if I do, oh I've done it, right. Um, <laughs> Because of the, um, the movement of people around the world, it seems as if things are becoming more diverse than they ever were before, but this is simply a mirage. Um, and it seems to be very evident in countries of Europe because of the, the uh, nation state ideology, the idea that there should be one particular language that represents the state and that people in the state need to identify with a particular language. But that is unraveling at the moment all over the world. <clears throat> and so it creates anxiety, it has implications for um, all education systems. It means that pretty much in every classroom of the world, we don't have classrooms where you only have children from one language background any longer. So it means that we're actually having to rethink all sorts of things that we thought were fairly safe. So we have to be rethinking curriculum, we have to be thinking pedagogy, we're having to think, rethink assessment. And what I'm going to be really referring to is evidence that comes from 120 years of research data from, from Africa, because we've been trying to grapple with these issues for 120 years. So we've got a pretty good idea of what works, what doesn't work. And because of the way in which the flows of migration are moving, there's a lot of evidence that we can say, look, if you're going to go down that route, you're going to waste your money. Don't go down that route, go to try and take a different route. I'm also going to be speaking in the context of what's helpful for teachers and what's helpful for teacher education. The very first thing that I want to say about this is that because I worked mostly in the global south, the kinds of solutions we come up with are very inexpensive solutions. We don't have money. We don't have a lot of money for glossy um, um, high-tech solutions. These are simple things that happen in the classroom. They're simple pedagogies and teachers have developed many of these pedagogies themselves and they basically use their common sense. And before I go any further, I just want to say more than anything else in the world, the most important thing for every teacher is to have common sense 
don't worry about all the big theories. If it doesn't make sense to you, don't try it. If it makes sense to you and you feel that that's the right thing to do, that's the right thing to do. Right, oh, so there's a whole lot of stuff going on at the moment. You're all aware of all the UNESCO frameworks. <clears throat> We're supposed to be moving towards um, um, sustainable development goals for 20, um, 2030 just 10, 10 years down the road. We're supposed to be particularly working on um, SDG 4. These are commitments that have been made by every government, um, pretty much every government in the world. Most governments haven't made much progress towards achieving um, sustainable development goal number four. So <clears throat> the United Nations General Assembly um, towards the end of 2018 started getting quite worried and there are a number of new frameworks and um, documents that have been signed over the last two years in which commitments towards multilingual education, commitments towards um, making sure that all countries pay attention to migrants and refugees um, in their education systems and recognising that because there are over 7,000 languages in the world, it's not as if every country can provide education in 7,000 languages, okay? So we have to find workable solutions. The only way we can do this is to share the expertise that we have. So we have to find ways of sharing what we know as, as usefully and productively as possible. So this does mean also recognising the contributions of development agencies such as VVOB. Um, I'm going to be focusing on capacity development, um, particularly on teacher education and pedagogy. Yesterday, um, with a group of uh, people that I met, I focused on the need for um, capacity development in relation to teacher education and also educational officials. It's not just teachers um, that um, are um, having difficulties, it's also teacher educators who are just not quite sure what they should be doing at this particular point in time, because things are changing so rapidly rapidly in terms of the, the uh, demographics in the classrooms. So what I hope I'm going to be doing is um, providing some fairly, well, I hope that they will be useful um, tips from things that we have learned along the way. And I will be referring specifically to pedagogy. I'll be referring to bilingualism, biliteracy, multilingualism, and a new vocabulary item that has entered the discourse around translanguaging. Um, and I hope to give a useful um, take on translanguaging. There's some takes on translanguaging which I think are not as useful as they could be, and I'm hoping to try to um, put some balance into the picture here. I'll also be referring to a, um, an approach, functional multilingual learning, that has been initiated through the University of Ghent and um, um, Professor Piet van Avermaet and colleagues um, um, right here in this city. Um, Right, so what I'm going to be looking at is what do we need to know, whether which doesn't matter um, who we are in relation to educational stakeholders, all of us need to know something. Many of us are parents, uh, many of us are teachers, many of us are teacher educators, and some of us might also be educational um, officials. So I'm looking at 120 years of research data on what fails in multilingual societies, because multilingual education has been there for at least 120 years, because maybe it's actually 140 now, because education in Africa, for example, started to be provided by the, um, the colonial powers pretty much in the late 1880s. So we're probably getting towards about a, um, 140 years, but we only really started collecting data on this about 120 years ago. What we know is that taking the child's mother tongue away from the child upon entry to school is about the worst possible thing that we can be doing. So to forbid children from using their home language in the classroom is probably tantamount to a human rights, a serious abuse of human rights. We also know that the gradual removal of the child's home language, in other words, transitional bilingual programs, don't work unless they are um, fairly elongated programs. And I'll come to um, some of these things in more detail in a little bit, um, in a little bit of time. <clears throat> 
We also know that it is really important for every child in every country also to develop high level proficiency in the dominant state language, whether this is an official language or a national language, because some countries refer to national languages, some countries refer to um, official languages. So we know that it is important for the education system to make sure that every child has the best possible opportunities to have access to that language and in a way in which the, that child can use the language in order to advance um, um, career-wise and in the whole life world um, opportunities that would lie outside of the school once the child leaves school. We know that um, there, we've got a lot of evidence about systematic and sustained use of bilingual and multilingual pedagogies in schooling for all students. And these pedagogies need not be frightening ones for teachers who feel that they don't know how to use the languages of the students. Don't have to worry about that. I hope I'll come to solutions for people in a while. Um, I'd just like to start off by um, referring to some parts of a quotation from a study that um, Professor Joseph Lorbianco was involved with. Um, he was asked to undertake um, a study of what was happening in um, Myanmar, um, Thailand and Malaysia um, a few years ago. And he was particularly asked to undertake the study on account of the fact that, as you know, there have been all sorts of issues with um, refugees fleeing from Myanmar and issues relating to exclusion from education and exclusion exclusion from um, um, opportunities for social cohesion. And he, well, I'm highlighting some of the things that he said about the role of literacy. A high rate of functional li literacy is really important in order for every child to gain access to cultural capital, material success through better skills acquisition, and to enhanced employability. This is a critical part of all uh, quality education. I'm just going to skip through and just look, focus on the highlighted sections. High rates of functional literacy in, in this child's mother tongue and the official languages are, language or languages of the society are absolutely essential. Focus on the mother tongue does not exclude a focus on the official language of the country. Children who have high rates, right, right, rates of functional literacy are more likely to gain uh, success in education and the processes of citizenship integration. And what we are struggling with at the moment um, in all countries of the world is how to include migrant students, how to make sure that they feel included and that the mainstream society does not feel afraid that the mainstream of society also knows how to uh, integrate with the, um, the migrant um, communities. So I'm going to focus here on uh, the role of, of literacy. What we know is that um, there is for every child a gap in literacy between early literacy and what happens in the school curriculum anywhere in the world between about the end of the third year of primary school and the fourth between the and then the fourth to sixth year of primary school in the first year or first three years of primary school it is normal to develop literacy in the official language of the school but most of the focus is on narrative literacy, the kind of literacy that one needs in order to read stories. But what children need to be able to read and understand from the fourth grade onwards is much more complex language. And we haven't found a way of bridging um, introduction to reading and reading for learning across the curriculum. So for most children of the world, they, they hit a sort of a wall, a wall that is a big that it provides a, a gap that they have to overcome between round about the end of gra grade three and uh, somewhere through grade four. Um, so this is a cognitive jump for all children. But for children who come from language backgrounds which are not the mainstream language, they have a double um, jump. So they have got to get literacy uh, in, in a second language. And for them to do that, if they start learning the second language when they arrive at school, by the end of the third grade, we found that at best, 
possibly they have learned between 500 and about 600 words in the second language, particularly for students who come from fairly low socioeconomic backgrounds and if their parents themselves are not middle class and have high levels of literacy. However, what we know in terms of the actual curriculum from um, year four or grade four onwards is that children need to have a vocabulary of five to 7,000 words. So the children who come from second language backgrounds, migrant children, have only about 10% of the required vocabulary in order to study through the medium of the dominant language. So if that's what they have, you must understand that they will not be able to do mathematics or science because they don't have a sufficient range of vocabulary to be able to adequately understand what, what the requirements are. For children who come from not only a second language background, but also who have come from interrupted early child um, education, from situations of conflict where they might, their families might have been um, displaced or they happen to be refugees. The jump is even greater. So those children face a triple jump, including issues relating to trauma. So what we found all over the world, um, largely because we've been able to track um, data in the United States, but we've also um, articulated or um, compared these data in many from um, a range of um, longitudinal studies in Africa, that student achievement seems to be more or less similar across whatever kinds of literacy programs children are in for the first three grades of school. So what happens is it looks as if the children the second language, the migrant children, are kind of doing all right for, year, for grades one, two, and three. But the gap starts to open in year four, grade four. So just as the main, the, there's, a, there's a jump for the home language speakers of the official language, they've got a jump, but the second language speakers can't make the jump at all. And I'm going to show you a graph in a minute to show you this. By the time students reach grade six or seven, the gap is so wide that it is impossible for the second language learners to catch up. And that pretty much means that we've lost those children from the schooling system. So now the, the, the data that I'm going to show you does, a lot of it comes from um, more than 150,000 students in the United States, but it's millions of children in Africa. The only programs that seem to work are where you have possibilities to maintain the home language or find opportunities to use the home language and to keep using the home language through um, the first six years of schooling. So this is the graph that I'm going to show you. Um, it is a graph that was originally developed by um, Thomas and Collier after a longitudinal study, um, an 11-year longitudinal study in uh, 1997. They've updated the graphs and I've adapted the graphs um, since then. But pretty much you see the same, uh, the same shape of the graphs. If you see that the, the, the four lines below the 50 percentile line, these are programs that children are in. Um, and you'll, sorry, first of all, you'll see that most children, doesn't matter what the programs are, the kids are doing the same, making the same sort of progress with reading up to um, grade three. And then by midway through grade three, you can start seeing that the differentiation appears. And by year four, grade four, you can see um, things beginning to become a lot more clear. And then by grade six, you can see that there are only two different, two types of programs that are going to work for minority children. The rest are going to peak at around about um, uh, grade six, and then they're going to pretty much start to lose ground against the mainstream students. So the children who are worst off are the children who are put into dominant language only classes. So if you take children and say, right, you have not, uh, you're not ready for um, learning through the state language, we're going to put you in um, a special program and you are just going to learn through English. I won't mention any other languages now. Look at what will happen to those children by the time they get to year 11. Those children will be in the bottom 24 percentile of the schooling system. 
And so it goes on. The second lowest R, you provide a little bit of the main language, you provide some scaffolding, plus a little bit of helping the students in the second language to understand the content for the first couple of years. Will they reach the 38th percentile um, round about um, grade six, and then they dip out at the 34 percentile round about year 11. So you can understand that those kids really don't have the life chances. They're not going to be able to get white collar jobs. They're not going to be able to go to university. They're not going to get into, uh, you know, the kinds of jobs that most parents have aspirations for. Then the children who are in early exit bilingual programs. Um, which means pretty much three years of mother tongue plus the good teaching of the second language. What might happen to those children is that they might end up by the end of year 11, close to 12 with, in the 35 percentile range. Students who have late exit programs might reach the 40 percentile range by the time they leave school. Children in bilingual programs where they have mother tongue plus um, the home language tend to be able to do better than the 50 percentile range and children where you have some children from, where well, you have children from at least two different language backgrounds in the class, they share information, they use each other for learning each other's languages, they do better than anybody else. Right, so what we found is that if we want to include students and make sure that they are going to stay in the schooling system beyond primary school, because um, we have found that in Africa, the majority of students were falling out of the schooling system. I have colleagues in India who call this pushed out of the schooling system before the end of primary school, because if children don't really understand what is happening, don't make any sense out of their learning, there is pretty little to keep them in school. Because I'm living in Australia at the moment, uh, we find this with the Indigenous Australian um, students living in rural and remote areas. Uh, the Australian government has put a lot of money into having as much English in the schools as possible. Uh, the Australian government has decided that bilingual education is not the way to go and that children have to have the first four hours of every day in English. And so they go around with vehicles, they pick up the children, they cart them off to school and as soon as the children can disappear out the door, they're gone and they don't come back. And on all of the national tests that they test the children in year three, year six, year nine, the Aboriginal children are at the bottom of the pile because they test them in English only. So we found this all over Africa, same thing in many parts of um, Southeast Asia uh, and so on. It's also the case in Central Asia uh, for minority children. Um, so the core message is for teachers and students and many from marginalised and displaced communities that we need to find ways and opportunities to recognise and work with the languages and the knowledge that students bring into the classroom and to see how that might be integrated into the mainstream curriculum. And likewise, for the mainstream students to see how they might also be able to learn from the students who come from marginalised or minority backgrounds. So. What I'm now going to do is to try and explain what we've learned by giving a couple of examples um, from, from Africa. The first example is um, of village children in post-conflict northwest, the northwest Nile region of Uganda. Um, the second example will be, I'm going to use um, some, I'll show you some little things that we did um, in South Africa um, around just shortly after the transition uh, from the apartheid system to the current um, um, language education policy. Uh, and then how we use this in India. Um, these things, these ideas are being used in Kazakhstan and uh, various Central Asian countries at the moment um, in order to try to include minority students in mainstream education systems. And then I'm going to give you a few little um, snippets of how we understand what migrant and refugee students, um, how they're using their multilingualism in a school, in a high school in our South Australia. So this is um, a few um, photographs from um, the northwest region of um, 
area of, of Uganda. The children live in villages. Um, and they live in very um, simple environments, but the children are multilingual because they actually live on the borders of um, soup. They live in this, uh, can you see that? Okay, so they, they, this is the Northwest Nile region here. And a part of this district, Arua, has been renamed Koboko. Now what happened was that um, from about 1979 onwards, with the end of the reign of um, Idi Amin, or the, 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 the period of Idi Amin, a lot of people from this region had to escape um, insurgents, and they had to escape by going across the border to South Sudan. So what happened was um, the children and the families picked up a language which is uh, basically an Arab-based Creole in South Sudan called Nubi. But the little area that I'm talking about is an area called Koboko, and the children and the community there speak a language called Kakwa. But you will see that this area is also bordering the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so because of movement back and forth across the border, people also speak Kiswahili as a sort of a regional uh, language. And then also um, they have exposure to English at school. Now, um, some years ago, um, a colleague, um, Eckhard Wolf, spent a bit of time in the area, and I've subsequently spent quite a bit of time in exactly the same area, and he noticed that the children were able to use several languages, and he identified um, that they could speak Nubi, uh, Luganda, Kiswahili, and English. Well, I found that they can also use Kakwa. And what happens is that when the children are together in groups of multi-aged groups in the village, um, the children create their own language policy and their own, own language regime. So the older ones want to show off so they speak English, but the little ones are not allowed to speak English because they're little. So what they do is they sort of, the older ones show off and say they speak English, and then the ones just below them will say, okay, we can speak Kiswahili. So they're allowed to speak Kiswahili, and then they go down to Luganda, and then it's Kakwa, and then it's Nubi. So the little toddlers have to speak Nubi. And when they... So what happens is the language regime changes. So when the older kids are out of the way, then the next lot says, oh, well, we can also speak English. But you lot can't speak English. You have to speak the next range. So the kids have their own regime of who's allowed to speak which language depending on who's around at any one time. So they don't have, you know, sort of um, academic proficiency in all of these languages, but they play with their multilingualism. They know when to use which language, how to use it, when they're allowed to use it, when they're not allowed to use it. So we call this functional multilingualism. You use your multilingualism for particular purposes. Now these are kids all over Africa do this. All over Africa. They do this in India as well. So I was working in a project attached to the University of Cape Town for a while, and we were working on the development of a multilingual education policy post-apartheid. Post, um, and in the Western Cape where I lived, children speak um, um, Afrikaans, Isikosa, uh, and English. And we developed this, we, th we thought about this, and we thought, how do you actually get children to, to work together in multilingual schools? How do we get them to share information? So we thought about um, how you could use wise sayings or proverbs, because we all teach our children proverbs, and we teach them proverbs because we want to keep them out of trouble, or we want to teach them lessons in life. So I'll just start with the English, English at the top, like a fish out of water. And because Afrikaans has some similarities to Dutch and Flans, I'm hoping that you will be able to understand. So in Afrikaans, we say Swiss or a fish op die droog grond. So um, now you see that I think that you can see that maybe a fish out of water uh, is a bit different from, you know, as, as like a fish on dry ground. So the thing that we found was that the children would then say, but why do you say it like that in English and why do we say it like that in Afrikaans? And by being able to see this in two languages, you get a slightly different perspective. You learn something new. You learn that, oh, well, actually, you know, fish are not going to survive on dry ground. And then they will have debates about why they can't 
survive on druer grond. So it's not just about translation here, it's also about gaining knowledge, that if you've got two, if you've got two eyes, two languages, you get extra information. So now this is another one. So what we did was we played with how you actually um, position languages. So we would play around with where we put the languages. So here we've got Afrikaans at the top. So na rien kom sonskein. Now, this, this, the, the, di the picture we've got here is half of this is Table Mountain with rain on it, and the other half is um, a, a rainbow. So in Afrikaans, we'd say, well, after rain comes sunshine, which is in the middle. But then in Kosa, we don't say that. We say, yakun umvula kulokoma ndlela, okay, which means, okay, well, the, 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 the rainbow comes out and we can play. Now, so you've got a slightly different take on the same thing. So then the kids know, the Afrikaans-speaking kids say, oh, well, that's interesting. Rainbows are really nice things. So then they, they're able to exchange different ways of looking at the world. They can see the world through different um, ways. Here's then um, Kosa um, at the top. Un vundla u zek in tlela. And in English we would say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, you can see this is not about an apple and a tree, okay. So then the kids, what's English speaking kids will say, well, why is that? Can anyone tell me why we've got bunny rabbits and little houses? Rabbits stay, the rabbits stay close to the home and why would we not have apples and trees? <laughs> we don't have, in the, in the areas where the close people grew up, they didn't have apple trees. <laughs> But they have lots of rabbits and the bunny rabbits and the, you know, they are a nuisance, but they hang around the house. Okay, but it's the same idea, the same concept. It's, it means the same thing. But by kids being able to say, well, that's interesting, why is that? Then they learn a little bit about history or geography or climate and vegetation and agriculture and all sorts of things. So you get information which actually has to do with um, biology or um geographical things, climate, all sorts of interesting things. So just using proverbs can actually open up all sorts of windows. So I took these ideas to India and I had to go to a workshop for teachers in a very poor area um, of Bhopal. And the teachers there had never thought about doing this and because there's only blackboards, they decided to try and translate some of the proverbs, some proverbs themselves. They thought about a proverb and then all of the languages that the teachers used were able to be placed on the board and then they had this debate about why there were different interpretations in the different languages. So these are the kinds of things that you can actually use in classrooms to get to break down barriers. So what I want to move here to is to say that translating knowledge language, it's not just about language, it's also about translating knowledge. Multilingual education is about opening windows to language, but it's also about opening windows to knowledge and knowledge exchange. So translating knowledge from one language to another involves both language and knowledge. Knowledge developed in one language may not be known in another language. So for example, people who speak Kosa will know that there are dozens of words for the word cow, which in English has a very few number of words. You know that if you happen to be people who live in the uh, in an Arctic circle, if you happen to be an Inuit person, you probably have dozens of words for snow and ice, but English doesn't have those words. So the knowledge that you have in particular languages is not translatable sometimes to across languages. So there's a lot of knowledge that is contained in languages that we can't always translate. And being able to have another language opens up another opportunity to understand things that one doesn't uh, know. So two-way exchanges of knowledge between the community and the school and between the school and the community involve not just translanguaging, but also transknowledging, learning to read the world. So teachers who think about both translanguaging and transknowledging, especially for students from indigenous minority and refugee communities, are likely to strengthen inclusion and the well-being of all students I saw. Thank you. Um, 
And this is important for not only the minority and the migrant students, but also for the more settled mainstream students. It's an opportunity to create balances and to try to remove the potential of fear and imbalances. So the mainstream students get to get have opportunities to understand things from migrant students and uh, students who, who come from different backgrounds. This is just a couple of little things that um, I have a, a student who completed her PhD um, a couple of years ago, and she was looking at um, how students, migrant and refugee students, use um, purposeful, make purposeful use of translanguaging. Um, amongst themselves while at school and also outside of the school. And what she found uh, was that the, the students would explain how they use their languages because a lot of students from migrant backgrounds or um, refugee backgrounds end up as, um, as working as interpreters or translators for their parents or members of their community. So Selena would have to go to the dentist with her parents or the doctor because she would be required to translate things. So young kids are actually acting out um, very important roles um, for their for their families, and then she also explained. Selena also explained how a new international student had come to the school. Now Selena comes <clears throat> from an Afghan background. She's part of the Hazaragi community. It's a very stigmatised minority community. She speaks Dari as well as Hazaragi, but her family had to. Um, had to seek refuge in Pakistan at one point, and so she learned Urdu in uh, Pakistan. And a girl had come from India, a new girl arrived from India, and the girl spoke um, Gujarati, but she had learned some Hindi at school. So Selena managed to include the new girl into the community in the school by using her Urdu, which is similar to Hindi, because spoken Urdu and spoken Hindi are very close. So she used her multilingual expertise to include a new migrant student. This was not unusual. It was something very common in this particular school. And then <clears throat> Shania would uh, explain, well, if I, th this is, these are not their names, by the way, obviously they're pseudonyms. If I don't get it straight away in English, I'll sort of put it in my head and sort of think about it in my language. And so it sort of gets into your brain and she works it out. And so what she's actually explaining is what's happening in the brain. So translanguages languaging is actually about the processes that go on inside the brain. It's not necessarily what comes out of your mouth. It's how you make sense of things and you convert things and you understand things. And then there was a student from, um, from Central Africa, from Burundi, or from, um, from Rwanda, actually, and she says, the book, what I have already written was in uh, Kinyaranda, and I will translate in Swahili and English. So because she was also a migrant and a refugee, she had to learn Kiswahili, and she's in Australia, and she has English, so she can actually do this in three languages. We sometimes don't realise how many language, what kind of language repertoire our students have, and what they can actually do. But it's very useful in the classroom because they can open up these vistas for us. Um, well, um, I think that uh, I won't really go into um, what the teachers said, but you, you will imagine and you will relate to the fact that many of the teachers in the school were very worried. At one point, they thought that the students shouldn't be speaking their languages in the school because they thought they might be talking about them and saying bad things about the teachers, and the teachers got very nervous. But over a while, after a period of time, the teachers started thinking, oh, well, maybe it's a useful thing that the students are actually using their languages. And they could see how the students who had been there for a while were able to include new students and find ways to use their multilingualism to bring them into the school and make them feel secure and included. So I'm now going to go on to the second principle is, the first principle is you've got to have two languages for literacy for most, in our most of our classrooms now, two plus languages, we can't get away from it. Um, functional multilingual development are two sides of the same coin. Because if we are talking about Dutch medium or French medium or English medium instruction, the only reason we would say that is because we know that underneath Dutch or French or English lie a whole lot of other languages. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to say that, right? So what we have to do is pull these apart and to say, okay, if we're trying to get the kids to Dutch medium or French medium or English medium education, 
what's a, what is underneath. So how do we get there? So put them side by side rather than hiding um, the issue. So <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is that multilingual approaches to teaching literacy, languages as subjects, and also across the curriculum are really important. It's not just about teaching languages as subjects. We've got to think about how we can use students' languages in teaching across the curriculum. How can we encourage the students to say, well, if we're talking about causes and events, if we're talking about climate change, how can we actually draw on the knowledge that students have in their own languages that might be helpful in the mainstream curriculum? And also get to the point where the students are developing high level um, academic proficiency in the mainstream school language. It's not an either or situation. It's the only solution because you can't do it without what's already there. You have to build on what's there in order to get to where the target is. Um, I will make sure that um, you can have a copy of the, um, the slides. So I'm skipping over to um, an understanding of functional multilingualism now. Functional multilingualism is a term that I um, uh, developed in South Africa more than 20 years ago because we realised that people use different languages for different purposes. So if I go to Mozambique and I don't speak Portuguese, I can actually read stuff in Portuguese because I've got some French but I can't speak Portuguese. So I've got some reading knowledge of Portuguese. And when I go into various parts of Africa, because I can speak Isikosa, I've got an understanding of some of the foundations and the structure of Bantu languages. So I use what I've got. So when I'm also in Belgium, I've got some Afrikaans and I've got some French from school and when I go into the supermarket and I can't quite understand what, um, what, what's, what the instructions are on the packaging, I read the Dutch and the French together and together I can work out more or less what's going on. So I'm not very good at either, but I use my multilingualism, functional multilingualism. That's what we do if we've got bits and pieces of many languages. So I distinguish between horizontal multilingualism where we use informal translanguaging processes where we focus on the where we use the fluidity between languages and this morning when I was just sort of wandering around and had my ears open I heard people in one sentence using Dutch French and English and I thought oh that's interesting I should have written down the sentences that I was listening to but I didn't and I just noticed that people were doing that and wherever I have been in the last couple of days I've noticed how people are moving back and forth between their languages this is horizontal multilingualism this is what we do in informal um, forms of, of, of communication now in the United States people have suddenly started looking at this and thinking this is the way to actually make sure that we include students in the schooling system and that we can use informal uh, multilingualism or translanguaging as it's, un as it's really used there. We focus on the fluidity of languages so that we don't exclude students for reasons of social um, justice. However, because I have worked most of my life in the global south, I know that people will be excluded unless they also develop high level proficiency in the language of power. It's no good just having a fluid multilingualism. So I will not get a job in Dutch or French. I might be able to work things out, but I would not get a job in either of those languages, right? I would only get a job in Dutch or French if I, was I had sufficiently high level proficiency in one of those languages. So we, our job in schools is also to provide um, access to high level proficiency in target languages. And hopefully in all countries of the world, it's not one target language, it's more than one language. So how to get there is to use purposive or systematic formal use of code switching or translanguaging. So this is vertical translanguaging, it's not the horizontal translanguaging. So inverted, my, assess, my trying to bridge some of the different discourses that are around at the, mo at the moment suggest that there's a place for using horizontal multilingualism and also for using vertical multilingualism. But our job in schools is not to leave kids in a no person's place between 
somebody is caught somewhere at the moment, but in a no, no man's land between two countries, of one of those ISIS people. Okay, so you can't leave kids in a no person's place. They've got to be able to know that they've got access um, somewhere. So we have to recognise that there are places and circumstances in which there are borders between languages uh, and access to higher education in the professional workplace makes those borders very visible. So if we are serious about inclusion and social justice, we also have to provide access for students to the standard academic use of languages. How we can do this is to use both horizontal and vertical translanguaging or functional multilingualism as our practice in classrooms. But it's not just about language. I hope that I have demonstrated it's about language and knowledge. It's about actually translating knowledge in a way in which we can actually advantage everybody. So it's not just about the minority students, it's also about the majority students, about giving the majority students access to worlds that they would not otherwise have come into contact with or known about. So I'm using the term translation of two-way exchange and translation of knowledge or transknowledging in order to build cohesion and also to avoid conflict and xenophobia. When people become fearful, we know that very soon we are in danger of moving in the direction of xenophobia. And unfortunately in South Africa, because after uh, 1994 when Mandela became the president, People from other parts of Africa thought that South Africa was the place of salvation and that they would find a safe place to go to. So many migrants and refugees came from other parts of Africa on account of conflict in their own countries, seeking a place of safety and hope in South Africa. And what they found in South Africa was a place where... Uh, Local people became fearful that the incoming people were going to take their jobs and because governments were not fast enough to respond to what was happening, we have had really serious outbreaks of xenophobia. Um, so we have to be very careful that the, the whole focus of and the, and the responsibility of education systems is to make sure that there's a good, meaningful education for all children and to use the education system to ensure that all students, the students who happen to belong to the country, come from the country, the mainstream students, know how to interact in a uh, cohesive way with incoming students and vice versa. It's two-way exchanges of language and knowledge. And if we don't find a way to do that, we are likely to be in trouble. So what I what I hope I'm doing also is to, to reinforce the initiative um, here from the University of Ghent uh, on functional multilingual learning turning the focus on learning. How can we best focus on learning in the school? And so the use of the term functional multilingual learning, I think is a very appropriate way to, to pursue things. I think that's it. Okay, there are a couple of resources in case you're interested. One is um, a, a resource on using multilingual approaches from th um, moving from theory to practice. It's a free download from um, this website, which you'll be able to find it. And Pete von Avermaet and I are um, two of three um, editors of a series of, of, of books on multilingualisms and diversities in education. And this is a very interesting book. It's set um, in a, it's based on um, the development of a really successful um, project in uh, a little school um, outside of Dublin where the teachers found their own way under the very able leadership of their um, principal of how to actually do precisely what I've been talking about today. So, there we go. Um, it's a conclusion, but I think I've said it, what I needed to say. Sorry if I went over time. Thank you.